Hi, my name is Emily Shosh. I'm with the Potter County Conservation District, and today I'm going to share with you a little bit about benthic macroinvertebrates. Benthic macroinvertebrates are insects that live in the stream. Here's a couple of examples. Some of them have to live into, in the stream for a few months, and some of them have to live there for, if you can believe it, a couple of years. And when they're ready, they emerge as insects with wings to be on land. So you might have seen some of those guys before if you fish, if you fly fish especially, or if you've just gone kicking around your stream at home, you might see them scuttle across rocks uh, uh, or in the mud or on plants too. So these guys are pretty cool in that they all start as an egg, as you can see there on our rocks under the stream water. They start as an egg, and depending on the species, they either become a nymph or a larva. It's the same stage, basically, because they have to stay in the water. But the ones that are larva become, that's supposed to be like a little cocoon, chrysalis. They, they go on to the pupa stage. The nymphs have to molt uh, a few times, depending on the species again, and then they become either what's called an emerger or again this can be called a molt stage and they'll be on the water or on plants sometimes on land um, they'll kind of hatch out of their uh, skin and become an adult so both of them follow that general cycle and we'll talk a little bit more about how long they live as adults or how long they're in the water um, later on but I want, you, what I want you to remember is this stage right here is where we're going to be finding those bugs. Everything we pull out of the stream is in the nymph larva uh, benthic macroinvertebrate stage. So why do we care about these benthic macroinvertebrates? Um, they are grouped into what's called pollutant tolerance groups. Um, so basically what we find in, the, in a stream, in any stream, uh, determines the water quality, how many pollute, how much pollutants are, are in the water. So if we have macroinvertebrates from mostly group one and two, very intolerant to pollution, moderately intolerant to pollution, they can't take pollution in their water, they need clean water. So if we mostly find these guys in a stream, A-OK, -okay. but if we find anything, well, if we find a a multitude of things from group three and four, then that's kind of bad for a stream. So, although we can test the pH, um, the temperature, uh, conductivity, chemical tests of the water, um, that doesn't, that gives us a snapshot of the water quality that day that we are out on the stream. These guys, as I mentioned, some of them need a few months and some of them need a few years to uh, be in the water and live in that nymph larva stage. So they give us a really comprehensive view of how this stream has been doing, not just the day that we're on it, but for the last you know few, few years potentially. So I will show you now West Branch Dingman Run, one of my favorite streams. And then we're going to get started with collecting some macros. So here's our West Branch Dingman Run. Beautiful little small stream, but a really, really important stream. You can see there's an abundance of riffles, runs, pools, some muddy areas, as well as some really rocky, colder areas. And of course, Above this gorgeous stream, it's a little dark, but that's our state tree, the eastern hemlock. Now the eastern hemlock, any tree, there's a bunch of trees in here, but mostly hemlocks, they're really important for stream health. They offer the shade that this stream needs to stay cold. Cold water is really important for fish, for amphibians, for these benthic macroinvertebrates as well. And then those, the roots of the trees also hold the bank intact and offer some habitat 
for things in the water and out of the water, of course. And that's West Branch Dingman Run. Our first bug here is the infamous mayfly. Fish love them and fishermen love them as well. They are mostly filter feeders and they reside on kind of the bottom. They might burrow or in this, in this guy's case, he sort of has a nice flat body for just scuttling across the tops and bottoms of rocks. And most of them in Pennsylvania are filter feeders. There's a few predatory species, but most of these guys just eat plants, live or decaying plants. And actually within their lifetime, they might shed or molt about 45 times. Uh, most Pennsylvania species live in the water for a year, like this guy. And once they hatch to become adults, they only live for basically most of them 24 hours, giving them enough time to emerge from the water, fly around a little bit, mate, and then lay their eggs to start the next generation. So our first bug under microscope again, this is a mayfly nymph. And the big ta-da with mayflies is their gills. So that moving feather-like structures is how he sends oxygen from the water to his body. And those vary from mayfly to mayfly in their color and size and shape, but they all move kind of in the same pattern like that. Now he's getting antsy, but I just do want to also point out that he's got those three tails which is really, really common for mayflies. Some species have two, but most have three. That's a good identifier for them. And if you look at the tips of his legs, they're pretty plain. They're just kind of pointed. Mayflies have one small hook at the tip of each leg, which is pretty different from a lot of the other bugs that we're about to look at. This bug here is pretty large. I think he's the largest of the bugs that I have to show you today. And he is a stonefly nymph. Stonefly nymphs are known for having those two tails, which you can see at his rear end. And then you can also see like above where his legs are, those are his hard wing pads or plates. So those will be where his wings uh, eventually come in once he's an adult. They have middle body segments of of gills so we can't see it right now but i might be able to show you later uh, if not i can explain where his gills are on him and something to note about stoneflies is they can spend anywhere from one to three years depending on the species in the water so they need to have that clean water for quite a long time in order to be uh, become an adult so in small streams, many of these species feast on leaves falling from the stream, trees, and then in larger waters, they might graze on other aquatic vegetation, um, like slime or scum, st stuff that covers the rocks, which you might have seen. And then there are some stoneflies that are actually predatory, so they might eat other smaller bugs. And these guys live... Uh, anywhere from a few days to a few weeks actually as adults that gives them their time to mate and start the next generation so let's put him under microscope so next up is our stonefly he wandered away a little bit there he is now you can see that the tips of his legs have two opposite facing claws and that's something that all members of, uh, well, all stoneflies are going to have. They might look a little bit different, but they're all going to have two claws like that. They also always have pretty long antenna, you can see. I mentioned his uh, wing plates, which are right there. And then, so the gills of these guys is a little difficult to see right now but there's white hairs that might peek out from underneath of him oops and those are actually the way that he breathes so let's follow him around and see if we can get those right there you can see those kind of tufts of the white hair we got us there we go see that okay Thank you, Mr. Stonefly. 
So the next bug I have to show you, we are not, unfortunately, we're not going to put it under microscope just because we only have the remnants of him. You can see this is just rocks from the stream that have been glued together and it has a big hollow end. So at one time what lived in here is what's called a caddis fly. I do have a picture that I can show you. If I would have found him, he'd look something like that. That in the larva stage. And there you can see a couple of examples of cases. Now some caddis flies um, make cases like that. Some of them are net spinning. So what that means is some of them have this protective house and some of them spin a net or create a shelter that they can go in and out of. It helps them, you know, catch food and for the net spinning caddis flies it also is uh, there for protection so we found remnants of a caddis fly I'm gonna count that as a caddis fly <laughs> so last but not least we have the dragonfly nymph these are the predators if you will of the benthic macroinvertebrate world a lot of them can stay in the water like as an in the nymph stage for as long as three years they are commonly associated with wetland and warm water habitats but you might find them in small pools alongside you know, still water alongside streams cold streams as well so like i said most of them nymphs even are predatory they eat small fish and other insects they're even known to stalk and hunt prey so they'll sort of hang out in you know the plant the still water and wait for something a small worm or a very very small fish to come by and they have extendable jaw mouth parts that catch its prey almost like a praying mantis would which is pretty terrifying but also very cool so even as adults too these guys are the predators of the insect world they can fly forwards and backwards and sideways which is pretty rare for insects um, and they also have amazing eyesight as adults as well. So that's our dragonfly. Let's look at some adaptations underwater, under microscope. All right, so last but not least, we have, again, our dragonfly nymph. Now, I want to point out that the tips of his legs have two claws as well, similar to our stonefly, but their claws kind of face forward. They're not really opposite facing. They don't have that hammerhead shark look of our of our stoneflies. They're forward facing claws. Also pretty different from the mayfly and stonefly. They don't really have any true tails. However, they do take in water from their rear end there and that's how they breathe. That's also how they propel themselves. That's how they swim through the water. By shooting that water back out. Like you can see some pretty large eyes which he'll mostly you know maintain those large eyes as I mentioned through to adulthood and he looks pretty dirty that's because where he came from he was in some stiller water like I said they liked some stiller warmer water and um, to hang out in and and basically hunt and we will put him back now here again we have our pollution tolerance groups and to remind you we found the stonefly the mayfly we found indicators of a caddis fly I also found a dragonfly and I found a couple of crane flies but they were too small to show you I'm sorry I didn't find anything really from group three or four maybe a couple of aquatic worms where there was just a shallow little spot near the stream, but that's totally normal. So the fact that we mostly found group one and two means, of course, that we found out that the water here is, is really healthy. We found some big macros, which means that they're nearing their adult stage. That means that for the last couple of years, probably as well, this water has been um, healthy. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. I sure did. I want you guys to know that if you are interested in collecting benthic macroinvertebrates, do it. It is a ton of fun and it's super, super easy. You can use nets like I did, or you can just flip over rocks and pick them off the rocks very carefully. But I do want you to remember that they live in the water, so please keep them in water. 
mostly out of sunlight and everything like that. Keep them safe. Make sure they're happy and make sure that you can return them to the water because, again, they are a very important part of the food chain, the aquatic food chain. Um, also remember that especially if you're handling any amphibians, um, include the macros as well, make sure your hands are clean. Any of the dirts and kind of human like oils that are on our hands can harm them because they breathe water or they breathe through their skin in the case of salamanders and frogs um, and things like that. So if you have any questions about anything we talked about today, please give the Potter County Conservation District or myself a call, a shout out, and I hope you have fun collecting macros at home.